We will begin with a keynote presentation by Dr. Daniel Salmezi, uh, brief presentations and a Q&A period by religious leaders representing Islam, Judaism, Catholicism, and Buddhism will follow. And the panel will be moderated by Mimi McAvoy. So it is now my special pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. It's a special pleasure because Dr. Solmezi has been a friend of mine for many years, and particularly special because he was a key influence in my recent pursuit of bioethics as a career. Dr. Salmezi is the Kilbride Clinton Professor of Medicine and Ethics in the Department of Medicine and Divinity School at the University of Chicago, where he serves as Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. He has previously held faculty positions at New York Medical College and Georgetown University. He received his AB and MD degrees from Cornell University and completed his residency, chief residency, and postdoctoral fellowship in general internal medicine at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. He received his PhD in philosophy from Georgetown University in 1995. Dr. Salmezi has served on numerous governmental advisory committees and was appointed to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues by President Obama in April 2010. His research interests encompass both theoretical and empirical investigations of the ethics of end-of-life decision-making, ethics education, and spirituality in medicine. He is the author of four books, The Healer's Calling, Methods in Medical Ethics, The Rebirth of the Clinic, and A Bomb for Gilead. He serves as editor-in-chief of the journal Theoretical Medicine and Bioethics. His numerous articles have appeared in medical, philosophical, and theological journals, and he has lectured widely both in the US and abroad. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Solmezi to speak to us about spiritual issues in the care of the dying. Dr. Solmezi. Thanks, uh, Liz, for that very uh, gracious uh, introduction. Um, Liz didn't say that actually we, where we met is that we were uh, medical school uh, roommates, uh, not roommates, uh, <laughs> uh, medical school classmates. And so uh, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a long, long friendship, not as intimate as I suggested at the very beginning. <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, a delight to be back also in the Bronx because I, I spent five years of my life in the, uh, in the Bronx, uh, in Throgs Neck and in the Soundview area. Um, but for people who are not from New York, particularly not from the Bronx, it can be um, a pretty odd. So when I looked actually at my Blackberry when I landed today, because I'm now living in Chicago, um, my secretary had put out an itinerary for me and it said that I was going to 1300 Mars Avenue. So. <laughs> So for people from Chicago, the Bronx can seem like Mars, I guess, but I don't know. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, uh, tonight, though, about spiritual issues in uh, uh, care um, at the end of, uh, end of life. Now, the typical way I think that um, most of us in healthcare uh, respond to the spiritual needs of patients are uh, the following. Unfortunately, I think the most common one is that we ignore. Uh, the, the needs of, of patients. Um, second, that we sometimes, what I'll say is quote unquote problematize them, that we make them into problems that we can fix. They become disposition problems or uh, reclassified as denial or questions about code status or futility or just in general ethical questions. Um, but I want to, as part of the take home message, suggest to, to you tonight that spirituality is something that is beyond all of those categories and hopefully uh, will help to open up all of our horizons. Um, I would define spirituality for us this way um, as our relationship with the transcendent questions that we confront as human beings and how we relate to those questions. It's a very broad. Um, definition of spirituality, which as you can see, would encompass um, almost um, anyone. It's distinct from religion. Religions are um, groups that have a set of texts, practices, and beliefs about the transcendent, typically shared by a particular community. So there's a sense in which you can say that spirituality is 
um, broader than religion because it can encompass even non-religious spiritualities of people who are grappling as human beings with these transcendent questions. Um, there's also a sense in which spirituality is narrower than uh, religion because within every religion, every human being is unique and even within a particular religion will approach these questions in the way that only individual persons uh, can respond. So because each human being is unique, each spirituality um, is unique. Religion and medicine um, really go together at the most critical nodes in the lives of human beings. Um, at birth, religion and medicine have a lot to do with both of those. Sexuality in the family, the well-being, what it means to be good and doing well as a human. Um, questions about the, our relationship as human beings to suffering, particularly our physical suffering, pain, and other symptoms, and death. Medicine and religion share these as very significant topics of interest, but come at these questions um, in very different ways that I would like to suggest to you are complementary and not antagonistic as it's sometimes cast. And spirituality, health, and health care have been related uh, recently by a lot of uh, folks who are doing empirical research as well. So health-related quality of life measures are now beginning to incorporate um, spirituality and in, in an instrument, for instance, called the McGill Quality of Life Questionnaire, which was administered to patients who are in their hospice program and are dying. Um, they would answer questions like, how is your activities of daily living? Uh, so-so. How's your pain? Oh, okay. Sort of all right. How's your breathing? Fair. I can get along. How's your spiritual life? Excellent. Outstanding. How's your overall quality of life? Excellent. Outstanding. The main driver of the overall assessment of a patient of quality of life as they're dying is actually spirituality and not the kinds of things that we think um, are so important from the narrowest view of what medicine is. Um, we also did a study at the St. Vincent's Comprehensive Cancer Center in Manhattan. Um, similar study has just been done by my colleague Far Curlin at the University of Chicago. The major uh, associated factor with dissatisfaction with the health care given to a hospitalized patient or an ambulatory cancer patient is not having their spiritual needs met by anyone in the system. Um, a real indictment upon us. Again, we may be losing focus for what's important to patients. Obviously, religious beliefs matter for questions of medical uh, ethics, questions like assisted suicide, feeding tubes, brain death, um, other kinds of questions. And there are religious practices that are obviously tied to health. Um, the diet someone um, will use may be prescribed by their religion and it may um, affect their uh, health care outcome. Um, there are uh, data that suggest that people who participate in religious services live a longer life, that, that religion can be a source of coping for patients, particularly with psychiatric disease that can help um, in their outcomes. So people are interested in this from a quantitative point of view and are beginning to look uh, at these questions uh, today. Depending on where the survey is done, between 52 and 94 percent of patients who have been surveyed want physicians to inquire about their spiritual needs. The average um, one's who, uh, re response rate for uh, whether the physician has actually done that is between zero and two percent. All right, big mismatch between the expectations of patients and what they're getting from us as physicians. Now the major spiritual questions um, I want to suggest to you are probably the obvious questions in the examining room, um, in the patient's room, in the hospital, on the gurney in the emergency room, but are not the questions that we typically train physicians to ask. These are questions about meaning, questions about value, and questions about relationship. And I want to suggest tonight to you that these questions are ultimately spiritual questions. That only persons who are struggling to be persons asking transcendent questions can come up with answers that will be satisfying um, to these questions. So the questions of meaning. You know, what is this all about? Why must I suffer? Why must my child uh, suffer? 
um, are the real questions that patients ask from a spiritual point of view that we tend to ignore. And the answers to those questions are the difference between hope and despair for those patients. If somebody asks you as the physician, you know, why, why doctor do I have AIDS, right? The answer may be, well, you know, there's a virus that we think may have uh, had a simian uh, origin that may have mutated um, in Africa and then gotten infected into human beings and transmitted through sociological conditions and the uh, habits that you uh, have of using intravenous drugs. Is that what the patient is actually asking when they ask, why is this happening to me? What's wrong with me? Why is this happening? I think the patients are asking it in a spiritual sense, and we answer only with the dryness um, of a scientific answer. We're not um, answering that patient's needs at the deeper level. Questions of value come up for patients. Um, they feel alienated. They feel um, that they are of less value because they are unproductive, um, uh, not part of, uh, of society, and illness has wrought this upon them. Um, and they need help in reclaiming their own dignity um, because they are human beings and not um, in virtue of anything they can do. Questions of relationship are important questions. All of us, particularly the older folks uh, here who are practitioners, know the uncanny way in which brokenness in body reminds patients of the brokenness in their relationships. Um, they seek reconciliation with the persons that they have hurt, from whom they have been alienated. They seek uh, reconciliation with the divine. Um, these are serious spiritual questions that you can either um, ignore, as we have most of the time, um, or begin to recognize are part and parcel of, a, of what it means to treat someone um, who is grappling with these transcendent questions. How can you do this? Um, I think it's a lot simpler than many of us would imagine. Um, it takes, um, uh, for instance, some very simple questions. To sit down at the patient's bedside, particularly at the, when they're dying, um, and ask them a question like, what do you make of all of this? Um, how are you doing? What's going on? Um, is there any hope you can see beyond a cure or even the control of your disease? Is hope a spiritual word for you? Questions like that, which I'm sure the, uh, if there are any uh, students doing their clinical rotations, they have rarely, if ever, seen an attending ask. But those are important questions that we can ask patients. The questions of value. Can you hold on to your own sense of dignity in the midst of this? Particularly think of someone who's had a deforming um, illness from whom other persons would shrink. And we are called by virtue um, of our profession to be physicians to treat them and to respect them as whole persons, even when others would shun them. You could ask questions like this. Seems like a lot of people really care about you, really care about you as a person. Is that true? Or you can ask, are there any spiritual or religious resources you can draw upon to help see you through this? These questions about relationship, again, so critically important for our patients, particularly at the end of life. How are things going with your family and friends? Is there anyone to whom you need to say, I'm sorry, or I love you? And if you know that the patient is religious, you can be as bold as Ned Kassam, a Jesuit psychiatrist at the Massachusetts General Hospital, one of the Harvard affiliates, who would just ask a patient, how are things between you and God? Critically important questions that patients are asking that are part and parcel of their experience of illness that we tend never to ask them. Now, many of you may be saying, oh my, what happens if I ask these questions and I get in too deep? Um, how am I going to get out of it? Well, I want to give you an exit strategy, something that we've been lacking in our foreign policy, um, I think, in many uh, circles. Um, but you can say this to the patient, because you, it may be that you've uncovered um, an, an enormous, difficult, spiritual crisis that the patient may be going through. And you can say, you know, I can't do everything. That's why we work as a team here. Um, I think we've covered some very important ground, but um, I think there's a lot more we have to talk about that you need to get through here. Um, is it okay with you um, if I uh, talk to Reverend S and send her to visit you and tell her a little bit about what we've discussed today? Um, would that be okay? 
You can ask questions like that um, as a way to back out, recognizing A, humbly, that MD does not stand for medical deity and you are not prepared to be the spiritual guru for your patient, but recognize that there are those who can, as part of the team, help them and then help you to extract yourself um, gracefully from the situation, but most importantly to show that you've cared enough to ask and cared enough to find the resources that the patient needs to deal with his or her struggles. So why is it that clinicians seem to hesitate? Well, I think one of the reasons is that we have trouble facing the limits of medicine. The quotes I uh, give to you here are from an article I wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association a few years ago, and they were part of a transcript that was given to me of interviews uh, with a, an oncologist and a nurse and a patient um, and, a, uh, and a chaplain about the care of a particular patient. And the oncologist said this, it's an awful thing to come to the patient with your bag of tricks empty. Right? We all go into medical school because we're in the fix-it mode. Right? We want to fix things for people, particularly if you're going to be a surgeon or you are a surgeon. Right? You want to say, you know, I can take that uh, diseased gallbladder out and you're fixed. Um, but these questions defy that kind of easy fix. Um, um, and so when, we're, when it's no longer possible for us to cure the patient and when our um, possibilities for ameliorating the patient's symptoms have run uh, uh, to an end and we can't even extend life very long anymore, we may feel inadequate ourselves. We have to learn to be comfortable with the limits of medicine ourselves. And that gives us an opportunity to address our own spirituality as well as that of patients. Often another reason people hesitate is they fear invading privacy. And here's another quote from there. You tread the line between being respectful of others' wishes to share with them with you, to share them with you, and probing to a certain extent. You know, we don't want to probe. But, but in fact, I showed you data that said the patients want you to ask about these kinds of issues. Um, so that fear may be ours and not that of the, of the patients. You may say, well, why don't we have chaplains do all this? Isn't that what we pay them for? Um, well, first, you should recognize that, unfortunately, chaplains aren't paid uh, enough, considering the important work that they do. Second, that there aren't enough of them. Um, but third, um, that there are important reasons that it is, um, I think, part of our duty as healthcare professionals. First, I showed you the survey data that suggests patients want you to ask those, about those questions. Um, second, from an ethical point of view, if you really are committed to treating patients as whole persons, and you will, um, or if you're a physician, you already have sworn an oath that says you will treat your patient to the best of your ability, right? That's what you swore to do. Then if you ignore these questions that are central to their struggles, then you are failing to do what uh, treatment that is to the best of your ability um, in dealing with them as whole persons. Third, there may be no one else who discovers the problem. Lots of patients will, in the midst of all the other papers they're given when they're admitted to the hospital, check the box that says, I don't want to see the chaplain. They may even be depressed, and that might be part of the reason. They say, I don't want to talk to anybody. Um, but it may be you um, who develop a rapport with them that can find out that what's going on with them is really significant from a spiritual point of view. So for instance, it may be that someone um, is HIV infected and is failing to take their antiretroviral drugs because they think that God is punishing them for the behavior that was associated with their acquiring the infection in the first place. Um, that's very important and powerful information. And you're not going to be in the position to be able um, to, to actually treat that yourself, but to know that. Um, maybe you may be able to get them the spiritual resources they need to deal with this kind of negative religious coping, help them spiritually, and then have the opportunity to help them medically in a way that you weren't able before. Um, and you need to be able to then recognize, as I said before, that you're part of a team, that there are others who can help, and you can refer to chaplains, to clergy, uh, to the patient's own congregations. Is there somebody I can talk to in your own congregation who can come in um, and be of assistance to you? We need to pay attention to 
to the clinical clues that patients leave us. You know, when I am teaching uh, physical diagnosis, I tell medical students or residents that they should examine the belly before they uh, just inspect it before they put their hand on it because if you see a little bit of fullness in the left upper quadrant, you're much more likely to be able to feel the spleen that's there than if you don't look first. But usually what happens when we go in, and again, those who are clinicians who have been on clinical rotations, and the team of white people, go, uh, white-coated people goes in, often white, <laughs> white and white-coated, goes, into the, goes into, the, the, into the patient's room, right? What, what happens when there's the Bible, or Shabbat candles, or the Quran, or some other religious emblem sitting on the bedstand next to the patient? We ignore it as if it said nothing, right? That patient may be having those, those items there purely for their own convenience and use, but I think if you reflect on it just a moment, you realize they're also saying something about who they are as persons, as embodied persons dealing with spiritual issues. And they, all you have to do is say, is that the Quran, right? To, and when you say that, you say, I see what you have put out there as saying something about who you are, and that's important for me to recognize, and I respect you for who you are in connection to that symbol. Um, and it opens up opportunities then for discussion that the patient may have thought was taboo uh, within the, uh, the relationship with the physician. Um, you can also ask open-ended questions um, of, of some sort. So I, I think actually when you sit down with the patient, the most important spiritual question you can ask is, how are you doing? Right? Sit down next to them. How are you doing as a person? Right? Um, and begin to let them talk about where they are um, in their own spiritual struggles uh, with the illness. There are formal ways to do this, and it's typically better to do it ahead of time than to wait till the moment of crisis for the, uh, for the, uh, for the patient. So um, I take a spiritual history of all my new patients as a general internist. Uh, one way to do it is this acronym called FICA. Um, it was developed by uh, Christina Puchalski and Dale Matthews and Joan Tino and I before a Society of General Internal Medicine meeting. Um, and it was April 15th, so that's maybe where we came up with the uh, FICA acronym. Um, but, um, but it stands for, for this. You want to know about their faith and beliefs. You want to know how important those are in their life, um, whether they belong to any kind of community uh, of spiritual support, um, and how they want you to act or address those, act upon or address um, their spirituality in the doctor-patient relationship. This is a little bit, in my view, like the cage questions. Um, it's okay for novices, and you want to get all that information. But again, I think that um, an open-ended question is much more helpful. And so the question I typically ask is, what role does spirituality or religion play in your life? Just giving people an opportunity to tell me a little bit more. When they say something, I can say, oh, tell me more. Um, that's interesting. It's important to know. Um, and um, it doesn't take much time, um, but it breaks the ice at the very least that it's OK to talk about spiritual issues, even from the very beginning of a doctor-patient relationship. And then it's not a surprise when you bring it up um, uh, at the, uh, in the terminal illness phase. Obviously, various religions um, have uh, specific beliefs um, about death and dying, about what spiritual practices um, would be valuable for patients, um, have their various religious practices with texts and, uh, and rituals and particular um, uh, ministers who might need to come. Um, they have their ethical questions that we uh, talked about before, and our panel is going to help us to s learn at least a little bit about uh, some of that from at least a few uh, particular religions. Um, we also have to recognize, though, that even people who are not religious, if you take seriously the definition of spirituality that I gave, do have spiritual needs that we need to address. They're more easily overlooked, but just because a person is not religious doesn't mean they don't have spiritual concerns that need to be addressed. They may be more difficult to address because they don't have, uh, you can't just call up the, uh, you know, the local uh, Buddhist monastery and get the nuns to come visit, right? You've got to um, work with that person to find out what the resources are for them, but they're just as important. There are some ethical issues to take um, under consideration when you're doing this. Um, 
One important one is the boundary issue. People worry that if we start allowing doctors to talk to patients about spiritual issues, they will begin to proselytize. That is absolutely forbidden. Um, you should never use the context of a doctor-patient relationship with its um, imbalance in power um, as a pretext for you to push your own religious um, uh, inquiries and, uh, and, um, and needs um, onto the patient. All right? So it's um, uh, up to, uh, that's a strong um, warning, but I think it's very powerful. And certainly you should never pray with a patient without their um, explicit consent. There are some people who will do that, um, but I think you need very explicit consent for that. Uh, the justification for this strong barrier is the intimacy of the doctor-patient relationship and the power imbalance, the vulnerability of the patient, and our need to respect um, their um, autonomy and not to push uh, um, our own uh, religious needs on them. The safest bet, I think, is, um, is to start gingerly asking those sort of open-ended questions and simply follow the patient's lead. Uh, let them uh, be your guide. Um, and certainly, as I suggested before, to make sure that you are humble enough to know when to refer when you're in over your head and recognize that there are people on the pastoral care team of the hospital or um, as part of hospice, which is a model of team care, um, who, can, uh, who can assist with those needs. Um, it is also um, important to recognize um, that the spiritual questions about meaning, value, and relationship are not only questions for patients. You may find yourself, um, particularly in the midst of taking a biochemistry exam of saying, you know, what's this all about? What am I doing here? What's the value of this? What's the meaning of it? It seems to be isolating me from, uh, um, from, uh, from other people, right? So those spiritual questions about meaning, value, and relationship are important for us um, as healthcare professionals and as persons as well. Um, and I'll uh, quote to you then from Abraham Heschel, who in the early 1960s actually addressed the American Medical Association. Uh, Rabbi uh, Heschel was a, a great um, religious thinker of the 20th century, and he told the assembled doctors there, I think it was 4,000 of them, to heal a person, you must first be a person. Right? To heal a person, you must first be a person. Rabbi Heschel was talking about spirituality in this deeper, uh, about healing in this deeper sense, which encompasses not just what the potassium level is, but who that person is as an embodied spiritual being grappling with transcendent questions. So while spiritual issues arise in the settings of acute and chronic illness um, um, in any sense, um, spiritual issues, I think, do assume, assume a special salience in care at the end of life, which is part of why um, we're having this conference uh, tonight. Um, it's sometimes joked that there are no atheists in foxholes and there are not too many in intensive care units either, right? There's a way in which um, the close of life sharpens these kinds of questions for, uh, for patients. Um, the spiritual needs of patients, I think, are inextricably bound up with the traditional duties of physicians. If, again, we are pledged to treating our patients as whole persons. And I want to suggest to you that attending to these needs is integral to the task of being a good physician. And I'll just end with um, a little bit of art for the, uh, for the evening. Um, anybody uh, recognize the, uh, the fresco or the artist? The, the artist is Giotto, um, and this is his depiction of the death of St. Francis of Assisi. Um, uh, I, I just want to ask for a second, do you see any um, ventilators in this picture? Right. Are there any feeding tubes? Any IV tubes? Right. None of that. Um, you see a man who's surrounded by people who love him, who care about him, who care for him. The last thing that Francis of Assisi ate was little bits of almond cookie that his friend and patroness, Lady Jacoba, brought to him from Rome up to Assisi. Just a little bits of uh, those, I think they were probably pignoli, the forerunners at least of pignoli, those uh, nice, nice cookies. Um, you can see um, the, uh, the painting uh, here has, um, uh, where is this, uh, this is it here. Um, this friar is looking up at the soul of Francis as it's uh, leaving, um, leaving him. Um, he's surrounded by um, all of these people who are praying with him, praying for him. 
Um, and Giotto paints this with an immense intimacy. This is one of the friars kissing the stigmatous wound of St. Francis's hand. Um, I think it's a spiritual death. I think it's what many of us would call death with dignity. Um, and I think it's possible um, in the 21st century, just as it was in the 13th, if we learn to really attend to our patients as whole persons. So thank you for your attention. And I think I've kept um, on time. And uh, we can um, move on to the, uh, uh, to the panel. So thank you. Thank you.